they're saying, I think it is personality. Uh, 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 some smarts, but I think a lot of it is personality. Um, because I think uh, Les's major achievement, and I'm not going to talk about it from now on, was to get um, the NIH NSF joint program in disease ecology off the ground. Um, I remember Les contacting me in the 90s somewhere and saying, oh, none of us are getting funded. You know, it's just there's no program at NSF. And it was true. There were, I think, Helen Alexander and myself had a grant, and one other person, I think, that Les actually got the grant was trying. There was nothing, there was no opportunity to do disease ecology. And I was moaning all the time. Oh, God, it's you know, so, you know, so dumb, I don't know what's good. Um, Les actually did something about it. <laughs> and he actually took the reins and got the committees going and started these. And I think a lot of us here have benefited enormously from them. And so I think that's, to me, Les's personality, getting up and going and doing it is, is is made of achievement. Uh, when Katya asked me to give a talk, um, I don't know, what do I talk about? And then she went, oh, I said, yeah, I'll talk about Les. So I'm happy to talk about Les. Well, then she needed a title. And I kind of went with the first things that came into my head. And these were the three words that came into my head. Satisfying, discounting, and cave leeches. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is Les at Mountain Lake. We've already talked about his uh, um, Renaissance man characteristics that's, that's taken yesterday uh, in my living room. That's one of his pots. So uh, he is an excellent potter. He had sails. Never gave me one. <laughs> <laughs> but they only cost like $35 or something. He went into his flat in Raleigh and he had all this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, so one of these words, the first word I know nothing about, in fact, I even misspell it, but I love that spelling. Um, uh, I think it's much better than the standard spelling. And basically, um, um, uh, it's already been mentioned. Uh, when when I, I first met Les, um, it was in Michigan, he was, he, he was a PhD student. I was a young faculty member. He was arranging my visit for a week. And boy, did he arrange it, you know. We heard all, all, all the weed we could smoke, you know. <laughs> he invited me to concerts by him and Dee Dee. And then he would have arranged other things which were very interesting. And, uh, we had a you know, great time. But the word he came up with then was satisfying. And he said, things don't optimize, they satisfy. And that word has stuck with me for 40 years now, almost 50 years maybe. Because um, up to then it was behavioral ecology and a lot of, bi not just behavioral ecology, a lot of evolutionary biology was stuck in optimality thinking. Mm -hmm. You always try and do the best, you optimize, evolution's perfect, it's the Pollyanna view of the world. And um, that word stuck with me. Things don't optimize, they don't have, they have incomplete information. They gather information as they go along. And then if some threshold is met, like, boy, I nearly need a drink. You know, you go out and get a drink. You know, in other words, less is all you did to this. And then it was poo-pooed for a long time, I think, in evolutionary biology. And then quite recently, or not super recently, there's a paper, um, 2005, which has basically brought the idea up again and showed in the context of behavioral studies it actually explains the data much better than much of optimality. I have no clue. I don't understand the paper. <laughs> Those of you who are you know, behavioral ecologists, how do you recommend? You're satisfied. Yeah, the world's not perfect. Evolution is building on the junkyard of past efforts, and it's doing it as best it can. It's not perfect. And that word, so it's satisfying. Evolution is good enough. You know, I don't know if it's really that good because it made us, but it's good enough. It gets people, gets organisms surviving, gets organisms mating once they first meet. The discounting. This was the biggest influence that Les had on the intellectual. Uh, this idea that variance is important. In fact, what I say to undergrad, well, not to undergrad, just sort of educators, I say there are only three things 
that undergraduates need to learn. One is that variance is as important, if not more important, than me. The second thing is that there is a thing called interaction, and that under some situations one thing is better, and another situation another thing is better. And the third thing is exponential growth. <laughs> so I think those are the only three things that your undergraduate really need to get out of university education. <laughs> As a scientist, you know. Um, variance discounting. Um, this is the idea that, um, and Les has already said this, and I'll, I'll just add that again. If you have a trait here that affects the fitness, and you have diminishing returns, then uh, if you have a particular trait, you can measure what the fitness gain is in that. But if that trait varies around the mean, and you average the outcomes, the mean is going to be less uh, than the non-variable situation than the mean. In other words, variance costs, variance, the, the variance discount, the fitness is discounted by the variance. If the shape of this curve were different, you'd have the reverse effect, and the variance would be improved. And I think that's a very fundamental idea, as I said, comes from economics. Um, and I just want to say I'm, I'm still using the idea. In fact, right now, um, I'm studying a phenomenon called community coalescence which is this idea that whole micro and this is that whole microbial communities can fuse. And then what are the consequences of whole community fusion? Most ecologists think of dispersal between communities, meta-community theory, meta-population theory. Um, with Matthias Rillig in Berlin, we've been developing the theory of community coalescence. Part of that theory um, is saying, well, is coalescence any different from just divert, what, is it, what, what are its effects? And the question that we've been asking is, if you have, if you have a series of populations that are diverging by drift, or, or you have communities that composition is diverging by drift, and then they fuse, and then separate, separate again, and they fuse and they become the average of what they were, will that, that, will that perpetuate diversity, genetic diversity or species diversity, or will it be faster erosion of diversity. So, well, if they all fuse together, then things should take actually a shorter time because they're all light and they all move to some neutral state. But in fact, um, so the question is, I've illustrated it in the next slide, and I don't know if you can see it at the back, I'm sorry, but basically this is time, this is the frequency of A, and it could be an allele or a species. And you have genetic drift, so these would be two subpopulations, each of which undergoing genetic drift. If they coalesce and the frequencies become the average, will that increase the rate of total fixation, or will it actually make it slower? Well, we did simulations, and, and, and then I thought, well, is there any theory? Is there any theory? And, and I thought, well, how far back do we have to go? And I went back to. Um, back to Kimura and Ota, 1969. Because they had actually worked it out theoretically, what is the probability of fixation of a gene um, starting at any given frequency. So if you start at an initial frequency of A, what is the time to fixation? If this is um, uh, very, very small, you start at a very low frequency, it takes a long time. If you start at a high frequency, it fixes very, very quickly. And you see it's a curve, diminishing return. And from that, if you can infer that actually, if you have um, put to, if you have a population on average, it will actually take longer to fix than if you have uh, the variance. So the variance would be a shorter time to fixation. No variance would be a longer time to fixation. So this basically leads to the conclusion that, uh, yeah, in other words, this is the right answer. In fact, coalescence will preserve uh, community diversity longer than well, non-coalescence. So this is coming directly from Les's ideas uh, that he came that he produced. Um, the other, um, no, the other. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I need to put a full screen. Yeah, the, 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 my, the, the disease I'm studying, I'm kind of a one, one disease kind of guy. Uh, for the past 25 years, I've been studying this disease. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, 
a fungal disease where the fungus produces spores in the flower instead of pollen. And so the disease is transmitted by pollinators. So it has the characteristics of a um, sexually transmitted disease and a vector transmitted disease. It's kind of in between. So it's a plant sexually transmitted disease. And so we've actually been interested in behavior. And so behavior of the pollinators. So we've actually been following on from Lesser's idea of bee boards that he talked about, looking at pollen behavior, pollinator behavior in artificial conditions. And so this is what we're doing. And, and again, I realized I didn't realize the room would be so long. But basically what we're doing is we're setting out bee boards. But we're doing the bee boards, and you can't see this at the back, by putting real flowers into floral tubes and then making arrangements in the field. This is our field site. It's pretty nice. Um, <laughs> it's, it is in here, Tully. It is in here. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> And, um, um, and so these are flowers in arrays, and we can put in diseased flowers. Health. This is one experiment, diseased flowers, and healthy female flowers, or healthy hermaphrodite flowers. And we then look at pollinator visitation, look at floral choice, and things like this. And we're actually now, my wife has a flat in London, which is uh, across a canal to the Springer Nature Offices. So I've been in discussion with them about extending their scope and their tentacles. <laughs> uh, and so we're getting, they're going to have this new journal called Nature and the <laughs> <laughs> So we're planning to submit that to the new, new journal that's coming out, Nature and the <laughs> But, well, and only to say, with regard to this, um, there's only one paper that deals with this, and it's a paper that he mentioned already, he did with Sunny and, 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 and other people, showing that basically you can ask how does vector preference affect disease spread, and basically this is the classic paper. We still go back to, I still say to, well, the undergraduate was doing that specific project, I said, look, go and read that paper, that's the paper because there really hasn't been anything exciting since, and it shows that vector, pre <laughs> vector preference, it's true in the vector preference data, um, yeah, that if you prefer, if, if the preference is with, the, the, the non-intuitive result is if the disease prevalence is low, then vectors that prefer disease plants actually spread the disease faster, because they're more likely to meet it, and then subsequently meet healthy plants. But if you increase the frequency of uh, the disease, then healthy preference is a better outcome. And so we're actually hoping we can go out and test that in the future in field experiments. So that's sort of m my link with, with Les in terms of research. Then there's teaching. I actually taught with Les at Mountain Lake Biological Station for three summers, and then of course we interacted at Mountain Lake because we were both doing research there. <coughs> Um, this is Mountain Lake Biological Station. It's a lovely place. It's a magical place. Um, and if any of you, a lot of you here are Mountain Lakers. And I only found this out when I was, you know, thinking about this talk. But online at the Mountain Lake website, you can actually get all the back issues of Mountain Lake Echoes, which is a sort of graffiti and gathering of, of, of jokes and, and events at Mountain Lake. Because, you know, it's summer camp for biologists, and so there's a lot of amusing stuff comes out. Um, it's called Mountain Lake Echoes, and what Les and I did was teach a plant population biology course, and this is the graffiti that the students produced in the Mountain Lake Echoes, and this shows one of the experiments that Les was in, involved with doing with the students, looking at pollinator behavior, and how they would move from plant to plant, and start at the bottom, sample up, to go to the bottom, sample up, because there's a graded production of nectar in this sequence, so you can actually look at sequential behavior of pollinators in the same way. Um, that, um, that site where we did that work was located um, in a small region, a small enclave, a place called Eggleston, though if you know it. But to get to that site, it was by a river, you had to go through a railway tunnel, uh, uh, an old deserted railway tunnel which is about 200 meters long, it wasn't maybe a bit further, so with a slight curve on it, so you had this excitement, you go in there, 
and in the middle you'd sort of lose sight of either side, it's so scary. And so, you know, we were very, thought, well, this is, well, I said to Les, this is a really boring lab. You know, surely we could do something to excite, make it, make it exciting. So, yeah, Les says, cave leeches. What cave leeches? <laughs> Yeah, let's, let's tell the students they're a cave leech. <laughs> so, so for about you know a few days before this lab, we, we guess in, in in the dining hall, it's all Les. Don't remember to tell the students about the leeches, you know. And uh, we said, oh yeah, yeah. You know, and we said, oh, make sure you bring hats and things. And they all, they all brought hats. And they brought <laughs> Then, then we say, well, make sure you get in there. <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, we got through the tunnel. Any of you get cave leeches? <laughs> no, no such thing. They all kind of jumped on us. <laughs> so we told them, that's a lesson. Never believe anything your lecturers tell us. <laughs> um, but what, what else came out of this? Oh yeah, this is this is us. Here we are. This is this is Salvador. No, it's not Salvador Dali. It's. <laughs> <laughs> what a strapping young man. That, that's pretty nice chap too. That's me. <laughs> so that's what, that's what we were doing. Teach, teaching plant population biology. Um, that's taken straight from. Unfortunately. I did have some photos of Les dancing wildly at a party at Mount Lake. I thought as Dee was here, I wouldn't show it. <laughs> um, so what, what else did they say? I think I'll just skip the next slide. This, this is what some of the uh, students said about it. Plant biology. For excitement, there was always Johannes and Les arguing a subtle theoretical point that nobody else understood. <laughs> Giannis himself is always the perfect gentleman, except in the feeble. <laughs> we all drink beers and count leaves on hundreds of plantains. <laughs> That's me. What do they say about Les? Les added a touch of 60s culture, vegetarianism, peace and love and coolness. <laughs> I think that's a good place to finish. So, <laughs> for his retirement, I wish less peace, love, and coolness. <laughs>